Hello everyone, bringing you the bonus mannequin video this month. As said in the mannequin of the month video earlier in the month, uh, there was actually a tie between two of the options presented in the poll over on Patreon. Uh, this was the second one, as I say, the, the one we looked at as the actual mannequin of the month, uh, British Army of the Rhine, very late 1950s, was the front runner for most of the, the voting period. This scraped in, in uh, with the same number of votes at the very end, someone else voted, and this came in uh, in a tie. Uh, so I looked at the, the one that had been the front runner for longest, obviously, is the mannequin of the month, and today we're going to be looking at this. And this is a, a mannequin representing a private, in the Royal Canadian Regiment, Vimy in 1917, obviously a very famous battle, uh, one of the most famous in Canadian military history, uh, and interesting to have a look at the kit from this time period, actually very, very similar, in fact almost indistinguishable aside from insignia, from that which the British Army would have been wearing at the time as well. Certainly in the field, Canadians were equipped by and large in British uniforms, British made webbing and so on, uh, there had been a move away from Canada's own version of 1908 equipment, uh, their own service dress and so forth, certainly in the field, basically indistinguishable from British troops at this time period, other than the insignia, which we will of course look at as we're moving the mannequin around. Um, starting at the top and working down, as we normally do, we have here the B-type Brodie, but with a Mark 1 liner, so there's still the raw edge helmet here, still very common at this time period, but fitted with the Mark 1 uh, design of liner. Um, so that is fairly standard headgear for the time period. You'd see Mark 1s as well, of course, with the, the rim to the helmet. Uh, but we have uh, the Brody Type B there with the, um, with the uh, Mark 1 liner in. My standard reenacting uh, Great War helmet, essentially. And then we have standard service dress, obviously. Bit of a Christmas tree look going on here with the kit that's worn over the top. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but the service dress itself, uh, this is a obviously post-First War. Um, original service dress uh, jacket which is filling in, sta uh, stand in essentially, does have the lined collar and so forth which is post Second World War, post uh, early Second World War uh, modification to the design, lack of darts and so forth but visually it's, it's very similar and serves the purpose but I will caveat that here that's something people have mentioned on other videos and you are quite correct this is not a Great War period service dress and not an original one uh, but it, uh, it is visually very similar and serves the purpose here on the mannequin in contrast to common British practice at the time, we do have collar badges worn. Uh, this is something that would be introduced into the British Army uh, with number one dress disappearing, uh, the red uh, uniform disappearing essentially from most troops, student the guards and bandsmen and so forth uh, between the wars or very, being worn very rarely anyway. Uh, the service dress was smartened up in British service and that included the addition of collar badges. Canada uh, wore collar badges uh, from the outset of the First World War uh, and they were introduced for various different uh, battalions. The Royal Canadian Regiment, of course, uh, had a pre-existing collar badge, and that's what we have here, uh, as opposed to the C with a battalion number, which was very common to see uh, for other Canadian battalions, which were raised. We have the uh, Pro Patria uh, scroll underneath, and we have a, a beaver with, uh, with its uh, left or right paw raised, uh, depending on the side of the, the collar that it's on. Um, and this is still the collar badge of the Royal Canadian Regiment to this day. You can see this collar badge in close-up. Uh, and that at the front here is one of the few things that really gives away the fact that this is Canadian uniform. Of course, at the front, dominating the front of the mannequin here, we have the haversack for the small box respirator. And down below we have the cartridge carriers from the 1908 pattern web equipment, uh, fully loaded. And then we also have additional ammunition here. Obviously, assault troops was quite common wearing battle order to make up for the weight of the pack with the carriage of more ammunition. And that's what we have here. We have a bandolier. And each of these, of course, contains 10 rounds. So you've got another 50 rounds of 303 ammunition uh, round there. Uh, so heavily loaded uh, in terms of ammunition, uh, carrying a very heavy ammunition load. Um, but that's uh, not uncommon, as I say, when the pack was ditched. And we'll see when we move this round, the, the mannequin is, the, the webbing is set up in battle order. Um, the pack's been dumped, so it does give you a bit of extra carrying capacity in terms of carrying extra ammunition. We'll move this round now and have a look at the left-hand side. On the left-hand side of the mannequin here, before we talk about anything else, I'll talk about the insignia that's been worn. On the shoulder here, we have Royal Canadian Regiment uh, shoulder title. Again, a pre-existing um, design, the RCR, just pre-war, if my understanding is correct on that. Um, so, again, uh, in contrast to many other Canadian battalions who wore the Canada title uh, and would then maybe have shoulder titles introduced later on in the war. The Royal Canadian Regiment of course had 
pre-existing insignia being uh, the regular force uh, for Canada at the time. The Canadians during the First World War introduced a very logical set of uh, battle insignia patches. Um, it was very common across all uh, British and Dominion forces to introduce battle patches. The British Army did, the Australians of course famously did. Uh, in fact, they've been, they're useful to be maintained as a form of unit identification. The same is true to a degree in Canada, and of course these were reintroduced for use in the Second World War, at least the divisional patches were. This, of course, being the blue-grey oblong, being the 3rd Canadian Division, and then this above shows both the battalion and brigade designation. The fact that it's green, the circle, shows that this is the senior, the 1st Brigade within the division, and the fact that it's a circle shows that this is the senior battalion within that brigade. So there's a logical, uh, with the change to the colour of this, it shows a different division. With the change of colour of this, it shows the different um, brigade within the division. And the change in the shape shows the different battalions. And that's consistent across the division. So it's quite a logical uh, and, and consistent uh, form of battle patch. A little bit uh, in contrast to British practice, where there were a lot of very different um, patches introduced, uh, often quite complex. These simple colour patches, as I say, it's very logical. There, there are tables, there are diagrams available online should you wish to see just which uh, battalions uh, wore what, depending on where they were, uh, depending on the division and the brigade to which they were assigned. So, as I say, uh, that is the, uh, the, the patch, uh, the set of patches worn by the Royal Canadian Regiment at this time. You can see both the shoulder title and the patch on the arm in closer detail. If we lift the arm out of the way, we can see underneath here the cartridge carriers, all the way around by the belt there, and we have here the bayonet for the uh, short magazine layout field rifle. By this time period, vast majority, certainly in photographs, vast majority of Canadian troops using the, the SMLE. Um, obviously the Ross had been something of a disaster, uh, and there are stories of Canadians taking SMLEs off, off dead British soldiers to replace them. Uh, quite what they were supposed to do with the Ross in that circumstance, I don't know, but it's something I've read about. But by this time period, the SMLE standard issue rifle essentially, uh, and we have the bayonet for that here. And then down below we have um, the, uh, the helve for the entrenching tool. In official use, the Rosses were sent off uh, with the transition to the SMLE. The Rosses were sent off uh, for use as training rifles, uh, freeing up more SMLEs in use in the UK for shipping out to France for use in the field and other theatres of war, of course. Um, but as I say, the earlier stories of Canadians ditching their Rosses and picking up SMLEs, I'm not quite sure how that's supposed to have worked, but it is something I've read about. Um, whether it is a, a yarn spun uh, from the fact that Ross was so bad and did have so many problems, I don't know. On the back, uh, we'll move this around now and we'll have a look at the back and see what's carried on the back of the web equipment. On the back of the web equipment here, we can see a, a fairly standard setup of battle order for this sort of late war period. Um, it really is getting into the late war period at this point and a lot of uh, adaptions have been made and that includes wearing the haversack on the back very regularly uh, and obviously in this you carry rations, uh, you hold all your essential uh, items, spare pair of socks, that sort of thing for the initial assault and lightens the load considerably uh, when compared to carrying the, the pack. To that we have the mess tins attached here without the cover in this instance, uh, not uncommon to see in photographs, Canadian troops at the time uh, lacking a cover but uh, otherwise carried in a fairly standard way from the straps on the back of the haversack there, very common to see in the field. And underneath that, of course, we have the head in its carrier for the entrenching tool, the helve of which we saw around attached to the side of the bayonet there. Uh, so that's what we've got carried on the back there. Round on the right here, we can see again the insignia on the arm, warm on both arms. If we lift the arm out of the way, we can see underneath here, we have the pouch for the, or the, the haversack for the pH, helmet type respirator. At this time period it was common to carry the SBR and it was regulation to carry the SBR and the PH as a reserve so you still see these being carried. Um, so as I say that would that would die out later in the war. I think 1918 was an order uh, stating these are no longer it's no longer necessary to carry a PH as a reserve but we have one here still uh, as a reserve at this time frame still very much uh, the order of the day. And then underneath that we have obviously the car cartridge carriers concealed by the bandolier and this is where I say that this sort of Christmas tree look with the bandolier over the top and then down below we have of course the enamel water bottle in its felt cover and then inside the carrier of the 1908 pattern web equipment there. All very standard, um, the standard setup of 1908 essentially in battle order for this time period and as I say not a lot really differentiating from British service other than the insignia 
um, which makes sense, the standardization in the field uh, of the equipment and so forth that's being used. So there we are, that's a look at the bonus mannequin, as I say, representing a private in the Royal Canadian Regiment, 1917, Vimy. Uh, very much standard for British Dominion troops at this time period. Obviously, the Australians had their own service dress and so forth still in the field. Even some of them were wearing British service dress. The Canadians, by and large, in the field have moved completely over to British issue service dress. So very little difference there other than the insignia, particularly when looking at Canadian troops. Uh, but there we are. I hope you found that interesting, uh, as I always say. If you do find this sort of content interesting and you'd like to see more, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done already. Uh, and if you are subscribing or, or you've already subscribed, do make sure you've hit the little bell, the notification button, and that will give you the option to be alerted when I upload future videos. It's a good way of keeping up with what's going on. Uh, if you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can do. There's a Patreon and a PayPal link down below. And thank you very much to everyone who supports me through those methods. It really is greatly appreciated. And of course, on Patreon, if you subscribe to the Corporal tier, you get the opportunity to vote on the Mannequin of the Month. And sometimes it ends up that I end up doing two because the, the voting splits that way. There is also, of course, the, the uh, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter pages for the channel where there'll be photographs of this posted up in a little more detail should you wish to see. Uh, and also there's an email address down below. If you don't use social media, but you'd like to make contact, please do obviously drop me a line using that. It's always interesting to hear from people. Uh, and as I say, I check that fairly regularly. So uh, if you want to make contact, it's a good way of doing it. But uh, I think that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.